Now, why should we be talking about slavery? Isn't that a rather passe subject? We all agree it was a bad thing, but it's gone. By the way, you'd be surprised how many people don't agree it's a bad thing. You could read Cominger, Morrison and Cominger's book. They talk about the happy, contented slaves in the South, you know. Uh, that book that just won all those prizes, Time on the Cross, talk about how slaves actually uh, increased their status and their skills and got training and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> you watch Gone with the Wind and, 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 and slavery looks like a... a um, a bracing uh, outdoor recreation out there. Quitting time. Let's go on in now. Oh, Missy Scarlet, are you happy? That's, and that's the impression that an incredible number of people still have about slavery. And make believe media, I made that point that those movies sometimes are the last chapter of history in our consciousness. So that's one. Secondly, slavery has not passed from history. There are scores of countries where forced labor is still a common practice. And in fact, most of third world labor, the conditions of third world labor are uh, more akin to slavery than they are to anything else. Also, slavery reveals in a magnified fashion the nature of class society. That's why I keep going back to it. How ruling interests are willing to reduce other human beings to utter misery in order to live well off their labor. And how they fashion then all sorts of ideologies to justify the horrors they impose. And for our purpose, the practice and ideology of slavery tell us something about the virulence of racism. The earliest, by the way, the earliest surviving defense of slavery that we've found written in antiquity was by none other than Aristotle in his politics, written in the fourth century BC. Aristotle, a great philosopher who proves himself not so great on this subject, he maintains, quote, some men are slaves by nature and others are freemen. By the condition of their souls, some are inferior to others. This being so, it is advantageous to both parties for this man to be a slave and that to be a master. It is good and just that some should be governed and others governed in the manner that nature intended. He called this system, by the way, mutual utility. You don't have to hiss. We know you don't like it. <laughs> he called this mutual utility. It's a community of interest. It's the best arrangement for everybody. And that has been the position of every ruling class publicist, leader, pundit, and propagandist from Aristotle's day to today. That the conditions, the social relations of oppression and inequality are really working out to be the best for everyone. They argue that the relations between rich and poor, between privileged and underprivileged, are an inevitable manifestation of nature itself rather than something that's created by social convention, by inheritance, by class inheritance, namely the family you're born into. I remember giving a, a, a class at uh, Lawton State a Penitentiary outside. It's the, it's the penitentiary. It's not really a state penitentiary. Lawton Penitentiary is the penitentiary for Washington, D.C. And I sat there and some of the guys said, how do we end here? He just said to me, how do we end up here, Mr. Prenny? I said, you ended up here because you lacked the foresight and resourcefulness and intelligence to pick the right parents at birth. If you had picked the right parents at birth, you'd be sitting in the U.S. Senate now. <laughs> convention, social convention, inheritance, economic exploitation, and state power. That's what determines uh, the, your station in life. Even the greatest philosophers we find, Aristotle, Plato and, all, Plato, and the rest, may share the self-serving propaganda of their times when property and class wealth are in question, because they were themselves members of that class. Now, some might argue, well, look, slave labor was the normal mode of surplus accumulation in ancient Greece. I mean, that was the natural condition. To criticize Aristotle for accepting what was an acceptable institution is to be guilty of what historians call the sin of presentism. That is, you are anachronistically imposing on your present day standards on a thoroughly different historical era. In response, I would say that indeed Aristotle's era is much unlike ours, but not completely so. Were it utterly different in every conceivable way, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. We wouldn't be able to comprehend its literature, its politics, its philosophy. It would all be incomprehensible to us. In fact, it's not incomprehensible. There are, there are recognizable themes of the human condition. 
There is much in them that transcends the fixedness of time and space so as to be a source of recognizable interest and even enrichment. That's why we love the Greeks and we go back and read the ancients so often. So if we can criticize and we can judge critically Greek art and literature, we can critically judge Greek slavery. Its horrors also transcend the fixedness of time. And the people of that day knew it also. That was my suspicion. I said to myself, there were critics then. We have no surviving writings, you know, from the 4th century. We have no fragments from the 3rd century. Um, but there were critics then that attacked slavery right then in Aristotle's day. How do I know that? Because he wouldn't have been writing a defense of slavery if, the, if it wasn't a, a question of, 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 of controversy. Furthermore, I went back and I picked up politics, which I admit I hadn't looked at since graduate school, and there, right there in chapter 2, he says, certain critics are of a contrary opinion. I said, ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> he doesn't name them, so their names are lost to us in history. But he says there are critics who maintain that, quote, all slavery is contrary to nature. What is wrong with them, Aristotle says. So if Aristotle could be challenged in his day, it is not anachronistic to challenge him today. In addition, in every slave society that I have studied, I discovered another social formation, another group of people who were very much against slavery, who were opposed to it, who didn't like it. Every single one of these societies. And I, I, as far as I know, I'm the first scholar to make this point, and I think it's testimony to the thoroughness of my research. They were called slaves. <laughs> You go up to a slave in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome. You go up to a galley slave who's tied there, a man who's going to spend the rest of his life in misery and agony, pushing one of those oars. And he's going to say to you, oh, you're being anachronistic. It's, it's, the, it's the dominant mode of our culture. He's going to say, yes, I hate it. I hate it out of my common humanity. Because this is not the way any human being should be treated. 